of Maui. We are delighted to welcome you to the 21st and first ever virtual Advanced Maui Optical and Space Surveillance Technologies Conference, also known as AMOS. Behind me is sacred Mount Haleakala, which is also home to some of the world's most sophisticated astronomical assets. With over 700 of you joining us from 25 countries around the world, we are honored you have chosen to share your time with us as we delve into three days of enriching dialogue and technical excellence. My name is Leslie Wilkins, President and CEO of Maui Economic Development Board, your host for the Amos Conference. As is customary, we open this occasion with a pule or invocation to honor Hawaii's unique sense of place and to set the tone for collaborative exchange and discourse. It is my pleasure to welcome back our dear friend, Kahu Kealaho Alika, who you may have remembered from last year's conference. We affectionately have deemed him the Amos Conference Chaplain. E ala e kalahi kahi kina i kamoana kamoana ho honu pi i kaleva kaleva nuu i kahi kina ai akala e ala e e ala e kalahi kahi kina i kamoana kamoana ho honu pi i kaleva kaleva nuu I kahiki na ayakala e ala e e ala e kalahi kahiki na i kamoana kamoana ho honu pi i kaleva kaleva nuu i kahiki na ayakala e ala e. Vilina me ke aloha i oko i ki a kakayaka. Aloha and good morning to you all. If you are returning to us as a participant uh, in, in the AMOS conference, welcome. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. The oli that I shared with you, the chant that I shared with you is appropriate for a time like this. The conference is starting here in Hawaii at 6.30 a.m. in the morning. The oli is an invocation or an invitation for the sun rising over Haleakala uh, to come and join us for the day. Um, over the years, our kupuna, our ancestors, told us mo'olelo, or stories, that come to us from ancient times. And one of the stories that I've shared with you over the years is the story about Maui. And it's appropriate for our time together this morning uh, for me to share that story with you again. Uh, whether or not you think the story is true, uh, it does teach a truth, and that's what I want to share with you. It said that many, many years ago, Maui lassoed the sun and slowed it down in its course. Maui did not do that to demonstrate his power and strength. He did that for the benefit of our kupuna or ancestors. By slowing down the sun in its course, the men were able to toil in the fields raising the taro or kalo. It provided time for the women to beat kapa into bark cloth for clothing, for bedding, and for other purposes. So what, what Maui did was not for his own benefit, but for the benefit of humankind. So I hope in your work together that you will see that what you are doing is for the benefit of humankind. Whatever countries you may be coming from to join us this morning, uh, that is the message I wanna share with you. The blessing is very simple. I know that we come from many different countries uh, with different ideologies, uh, cultural and traditions, um, and even religious traditions. Yeah? But whatever they may be, we gather together as people of goodwill. So the blessing is this. He po mai ka ineao iki a ahahalawai o Amos 2020, i loko ka o ka we offer this blessing for your gathering here virtually, gathering here on Maui uh, for Amos 2020 in the name of the Spirit of God. Aloha e, aloha e, aloha e. Aloha. 
Thank you, Kahu, for bestowing your mana'o or thoughts and blessings upon the Amos Conference. In today's climate of COVID-19, impacting not only the way we conduct business, but more importantly, how we travel and meet, we sought the counsel of our partners and stakeholders to arrive at the conclusion that we must continue to meet the expectations of our Amos community through a virtual presentation of this year's conference. With that said, we extend immense gratitude to our sponsors who have entrusted us to deliver the caliber and content that Amos Conference is known for in a realm that is entirely new to our team and to our audience. We thank you for your loyalty and your patience as we chartered this new path forward. At the Po'okela level, we mahalo the Boeing Company for their continued commitment and dedication at the highest level. As the prime contractor on Maui for the Air Force Research Laboratory, Boeing has been a tremendous community partner in our local STEM student to workforce pipeline. Next, we thank our La Lima sponsors, Exo Analytics Solutions, Kratos, L3 Harris, Northrop Grumman, and Paraton. At the Lokahi level, AGI, Ball Aerospace, Lockheed Martin, SAIC, Secure World Foundation, and Space Foundation. At the Kupa'a level, Centauri, Charles River Analytics, General Atomics, Electromagnetic Systems, and Numerica Corporation. And our Malama sponsors, AI Solutions, Applied Optimization, Astro Haven, Braxton, DLR Space Administration, Japan Space Forum, John Hopkins University Applied Physics Laboratory, Leo Labs, North Star Earth and Space, Plane Wave Instruments, Sarah Data, Software BISC, and USRA. In this new arena of virtual exhibit halls, how do you replicate the strategic exchange of information and the invaluable relationships that form while waiting in line for a cup of coffee, or in the Amos case, a scoop of ice cream or even a Mai Tai? Although the organic sense of a casual hallway conversation may be lost in translation, technology has enabled the dialogue to continue. We encourage you to visit the exhibit hall to explore the innovative offerings our exhibitors have to share with you. Dedicated time has been set aside at the start and conclusion of each program day, as well as during breaks. So please enjoy. And there is an advantage that a virtual conference has over an in-person event. The exhibit hall is never closed. We are delighted to feature 32 exhibiting companies and thank them for their support. Our call for papers yielded a record-breaking number of submissions, a quarter of which originated from 15 different countries. We thank the many contributors who submitted and the session chairs and reviewers who shared time and expertise to help us shape this year's program. We are excited to showcase over 120 premier technical presentations that cover a wide range of topics from atmospherics to cislunar SSA to machine learning applications. To our presenters and session chairs who have made this journey to the world of virtual conferences with us, we are grateful for your willingness to embrace new procedures, deadlines, and presentation technology and for your flexibility in being available to the Amos community for questions during your live Q&A sessions and poster sessions across multiple time zones. We also want to thank our collaborative partners who continue to enhance the many dimensions of the conference. This includes the Space Generation Advisory Council, or SGAC, as we kick off the third annual cohort of Emergen a program designed especially for young professionals and students enthusiastic about careers in space. We are thrilled to share that we have 42 individuals from 13 countries participating in this year's program. 
which was developed with the help of three SDAC organizing team members. A very special thank you to Michael Barton, Quentin Verspiren, and Amber Imai Hong. Be sure to tune in tomorrow as the Emergent Delegates report out on this year's program. The Amos Conference aims to recognize outstanding efforts in the field of space domain awareness, including the endeavors put forth by the next generation of the space enterprise. We thank American Astronautical Society's Space Surveillance Technical Committee, or SSTC, for their continued collaboration as we present the third annual Amos Conference Student Award and Best Paper Award. Please join us at the conference closing as we honor this year's winners. In addition, select papers presented at this year's conference will have the opportunity to be peer-reviewed and published in the Journal of Astronautical Sciences, Amos Special Topic, a collaboration since 2017. We are grateful to the AAS SSTC for acknowledging the technical merits and state-of-the-art contributions of the Amos community. Each day, the conference kicks off with a keynote address and SSA policy sessions. The successful mix of technical and policy discussions have become a hallmark of our program over the past nine years. We thank Secure World Foundation for their guidance in shaping relevant and critical panels featuring a range of thought leaders, industry, academia, and policymakers. The Amos Conference has its roots in Maui's astronomical and space surveillance assets and was developed in part to create a nexus for its user community. I am pleased to acknowledge and thank Lieutenant Colonel John Zingarelli, commander of AFRL's Detachment 15 here on Maui for their long-standing commitment. I know you are well acquainted with our Amos Conference team, Sandy Ryan, Amber Hardwick, Annette Lynch and Leilani Ventura. They have been working tirelessly for months, guided by our conference chairs, Paul Curvin, who has served in this capacity since the first Amos Conference in 1999, and Darren Nishimoto, Director of Advanced Technologies at Maui's own Pacific Defense Solutions, a Satari company, to develop a virtual conference experience that is productive and successful for all of you. I know I don't have the audience to ask for their applause and gratitude, but virtually, please take a moment to say thank you to their amazing efforts. Each year, we ask for your feedback and we use it. Please take the time to share your comments with us. Your recommendations are the guiding insights that will shape Amos 2021, when we hope to be able to welcome you back to Maui in person. And now it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Kelly Hammett, Director of the Air Force Research Laboratory's Directed Energy Directorate, who will be introducing today's keynote speaker. Kelly has been part of the Amos Ohana, or family, since his time as commander of the AFRL site here on Maui, nearly two decades ago. more than 850 participants that are joining us this year for the the virtual Amos conference um, General Whiting and I were were in uh, Maui two years ago uh, for this venue we we wish we were there now we're, we're with you virtually here I've got my uniform of the day on as if I, I was there with you um, and so uh, it's my great pleasure and honor uh, to continue to be part of the Amos Conference, the Amos 2020 Conference, to introduce our, our keynote speaker this morning, um, Major General Stephen Whiting. Um, so I was taking a look at his bio. Uh, wow, lots of great experience, lots of job titles. Uh, current title, Deputy Commander, U.S. Space Force Headquarters, soon to have a new title commander of uh, Space Operations Command, one of the new field commands standing up under the Space Force. Uh, General Whiting uh, was commissioned uh, way back when, uh, over 30 years of commissioned service from the Air Force Academy, holds a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering, a couple of master's degrees, one in organizational management and one in strategic studies. 
He is a career space operator, uh, has had a multitude of assignments in operations and has commanded at the, the squadron, the group, the center, um, uh, and now will be at the, at the field command level um, with, the, with the activation of Spock upcoming here very quickly. Um, so General Whiting has been a former commander of the JSPOC and I guess the CSPOC, you were there for the, for the transition of that. Commander of the 14th Air Force when we were last together, I think, uh, out in Maui. Uh, and so we could not have a better uh, keynote speaker to kick off uh, Amos 2020. And so with that, uh, again, my pleasure and honor to introduce General Whiting. Hey, thanks, Kelly, and thanks for being here in Colorado Springs with us. Well, let me get right into it. By the year 480 BC, the Persian Empire was rapidly expanding into modern day India and all the way into Egypt and the continent of Africa. Looking to solidify their base in the Mediterranean for that expansion, the Persians set their sights on conquering the powerful city states in what is now Greece, including their great nemesis, Athens. During what became known as the Greco-Persian War, the Persians fielded the largest army and navy ever seen to date. From the perspective of the Athenians, the vast Persian army seemed overwhelming. The pending conflict appeared unwinnable for them. Thanks to a fellow named Thucydides and more modern historians of the classics like Victor Davis Hanson, we now know that despite the overwhelming odds, the Greeks actually won and the Persians were vanquished. Now, I didn't mention to Dr. Hammett up front that I'd be <laughs> recounting ancient history in my remarks, so I'm certain he's wondering what this possibly has to do with Amos, the Space Domain Awareness Mission, and gathering virtually today to speak about this profoundly critical capability. I promise we'll get to that. In the meantime, though, I have to say thank you to Dr. Hammett for the kind introduction and the warm welcome. Aloha and mahalo to audience members joining us today on Zoom. I truly wish we could all be on Maui for the 21st edition of the Amos Conference, but using capabilities, many of which are space-enabled, to gather from around the world at least we're able to meet virtually. More importantly, we are able to continue the critical dialogue and build on our advancements in space situational awareness and space domain awareness. But I do hope that next year we will be able to gather in paradise, I mean Maui, once again, <laughs> face to face for this superb conference. And selfishly, I hope that the fact I'm speaking here this year doesn't preclude me from getting an invite next year. Last year, you heard from my good friend and colleague, Major General John Shaw. From what I understand, he used an ingenious hook as the framework for his speech, quoting Shakespeare and linking the quote to our current SDA efforts. People are still talking about that speech as they should. General Shaw is a leading thinker, speaker, and commander in our business. And he's known to favor the Bard of Avon, the world's most renowned poet and playwright. I, however, really prefer the great philosophers to poets. My favorite is Homer. He said something profound, which actually does a pretty good job of framing my message to you on space domain awareness today. He once said, every time I learn something new, it pushes some old stuff out of my brain. Yes, you probably thought I meant the Homer of Iliad and Odyssey fame, but no, I meant the other Homer, cartoon Homer Simpson of Springfield <laughs> fame. Every time I learn something new, it pushes some old stuff out of my brain. It's brilliant when you think of it, because it often happens to most of us. And it happens pretty frequently in military operations as well, especially when we're at war. A commander gets so inundated with information that sometimes you just reach the saturation point. The information deluge becomes overwhelming and your ability to make effective wartime decisions becomes clouded. You all likely remember the classic DIKW pyramid, the model representing structural and functional relationships between data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. There is always an excessive amount of information. The breadth of wisdom at the top of the pyramid is decidedly more narrow. When too much information pushes some of the critical old stuff out of your brain, the wisdom informing an effective warfighting decision is harder to come by. That's why an evolution from an information-centric space situational awareness mission set to a wisdom generating warfighting decision enabling space domain awareness mission set is so critical. SSA was fundamentally information centric. SDA is designed to be wisdom centric. You're all familiar with the SDA definition, first laid out publicly in General Shaw's memo last year, where he wrote, quote, the effective identification, characterization, and understanding of any factor, passive or active, associated with the space domain, 
unquote. What's key in the definition are the words characterization and understanding. That's what takes the situational awareness of a benign operating environment and turns it into the predictive and current domain capability necessary for a warfighting environment. As we prepare for conflict in, from, and to space, the value of translating volumes of data into effective warfighting decisions becomes clear. Commanders must turn information into wisdom to inform effective warfighting leadership. Homer Simpson's concern about pushing old stuff out of his brain is perhaps not so much a concern as long as the new stuff replacing it leads to big picture awareness enabling good warfighting decisions. Now I'm sure you remember the details of the decisive battle of Salamis. I'm sure Themistocles and the Greeks knew they did not have a chance to defeat King Xerxes and the Persian Navy in open waters. Knowing this, Themistocles feigned a retreat and pushed the Greek Navy to fall back into the Straits of Salamis where he knew his smaller, more maneuverable ships would have a greater advantage. Xerxes, favoring the doctrine of swift victory, took the bait. He ordered his Persian Navy ships to continue pursuing the Athenians and enter the Straits of Salamis. Themistocles anticipated this Persian misstep and annihilated them, delivering a crushing, retreat-inducing defeat to their empire. It was his ability to survey the battlefield that provided him the right kind of information, enabling the wisdom that informed warfighting decisions, which resulted in the Greek victory. His ability not just to know the battlefield, but to characterize and understand the big picture elements of the current circumstances governing that battlefield allowed for so decisive a victory. You have to wonder what Rosetta Stone Themistocles had that led to his strategic and tactical decisions in the Greco-Persian War. A third of the original Rosetta Stone was written in Greek after all. Whatever he had, he managed to crack the code that revealed the battlefield circumstances prompting him to surround a superior Persian force and vanquish it. My guess is that he waded through a sea of information and found some level of wisdom. Some ancient version of a modern day SDA capability informed his decision making. Today, we can't necessarily count on the physical battlefield circumstances which augmented Themistocles' battlefield awareness, giving the Athenians additional advantage. There might not be another Salamis or Thermopylae to funnel an invading army or navy into a kill zone. Especially in space, we are far more dependent on robust domain awareness. That's where we'll look to you all for help. As our battle space changes and evolves, we need to fully characterize all of its actors and assets. Information remains critical, but more important is the characterization and understanding of the domain we need and the resulting wisdom that comes from it. Understanding the information and its context ultimately drives our decision-making and warfighting effectiveness. Now, as Kelly said, I've been involved with the military space program for just north of three decades. I've seen some extraordinary changes in that time, and I've been amazed at the evolution of our capabilities. The technological developments in that time have been mind-boggling. Equally amazing has been the accompanying exponential growth in the sheer number of satellites and objects on orbit. Just last year in May, for example, SpaceX put the first 60 of their Starlink satellite internet vehicles on orbit on one Falcon 9. Today, a mere 16 months later, almost 775 Starlink satellites are on orbit. Nearly 800 satellites from just one constellation in barely more than a year. It took all the world's spacefaring nation years to get to 800 spacecraft on orbit after the launch of Sputnik in 1957. Clearly, we have witnessed explosive growth in the number and capabilities of spacefaring nations, both allied and potentially adversarial. We've welcomed extraordinary numbers of commercial and academic partners into the domain, and increasingly, they're becoming the dominant players in putting capability on orbit. Alliances among those players from a business case perspective are increasingly the norm, just as the alliances with the United States and our allies come from a protect and defend perspective. Given the complexity of the operating environment, not to mention the significance of the threats emerging in that environment, no spacefaring entity goes it alone anymore. That's not unlike the situation Themistocles had to manage in the fourth century BC. When the Greek city-states got wind that their land was the next target for the Persian Empire, they started to build their defensive strategy. No one city-state could match up to the great Persian army. 
The Greeks knew they needed an alliance among all of their city-states to stand a chance against such a sizable force. They could not protect and defend their interest in the region alone, just as we can't in space today. When I spoke to this forum two years ago, I focused on the strategic mission of aligning SSA efforts to support our warfighting objectives. Our legacy function of SSA, cataloging and tracking space objects, remains critical, but situational awareness is no longer sufficient. Themistocles pivoted to exploit favorable developments in both the strategic and tactical situations presented him in the battles of the Greco-Persian War. Today, we're all part of a new pivot army, as Gordon Kordiak would have it. Or perhaps we're better described as a pivot force, with our new space force taking lead on developing the tactics, techniques, and procedures necessary to best employ the remarkable technological advances of space domain awareness that members of this audience have given us. Goodness, what Xerxes might have been able to do with GSAP, but fortunately for the Greeks and the Athenians, he didn't have even antiquities equivalent. What, though, do our potential adversaries have today to counter those exquisite capabilities we're developing? And what more must we do to counter the capabilities they're developing? Let's be clear. The United States does not want a new arms race in space. But the reality of today's strategic environment compels us to accept that space is a warfighting domain. And we must prepare to deter a conflict from beginning in or extending into space. And if deterrence fails, we must be prepared to win on behalf of our nation and our allies. And have no doubt, space domain awareness will be our Rosetta Stone cracking the code on how to achieve that victory. SDA's holistic approach to space warfighting is best applied across the three dimensions of physical, network, and cognitive space operations to paint a better contextual picture of what we'll face in the domain. SDA's focus in the physical dimension physical assets and environmental conditions in order to augment data with additional mission-related detail, along with its network dimension focus, enabling information transition, remain key foundations of our quest to inform better warfighting decisions. Yet it's the efforts in SDA's cognitive dimension that are perhaps most significant in developing a true pivot SDA effort. We refer repeatedly to Sun Tzu's famous imperative, know thy enemy, know thyself. Accepting that imperative, it becomes clear how valuable full domain awareness becomes in our effort to protect and defend U.S. and allied interests in space. SDA provides us insight into space actors and their objectives, intentions, and decision-making processes. That leads to more informed and therefore more effective decision-making capability and pre predictive planning. It becomes, in effect, our foundation for all space warfighting operations. Because it is so central to that foundation, we have logically made space domain awareness one of the five core competencies of our new Space Force, along with space security, combat power projection, space mobility and logistics, and information mobility. They're all defined in our Space Capstone publication, outlining the doctrine of our sixth branch of the armed forces, providing the fundamental principles guiding military space operations in achieving our national objectives. If you haven't yet done so, I encourage all of you to read the entire document. It defines well, both explicitly and implicitly, the significance of SDA's contributions to national defense. We have evolved to a point in military space operations where we must think in terms of space warfighting versus space operations, engagement versus observation, proactive analysis versus passive recording. None of this is intended to devalue decades worth of our previous approach. In fact, I've spent most of my career working in that previous paradigm. Rather, it's simply to emphasize that the environment has changed, that military space operations have reached an inflection point where aspirational rhetoric has now become operational reality, reflecting the need to prepare to fight and win in space. Our objective, of course, remains to avoid that fight. But even George Washington, centuries before humanity could even dream of operating in space, reflected a remarkably contemporary imperative in his axiom delivered to both houses of Congress. Quote, to be prepared for war is one of the most effectual means of preserving peace. The need for such preparation is precisely why you've seen rapid development of our partnerships with other department agencies, uh, with other government agencies, excuse me, such as the Department of Commerce. Among the most transformational developments in the US government approach to operations in space, 
the Department of Commerce will provide basic space traffic management and SSA services for commercial, civil, academic, and international cu customers, allowing DOD to exclusively focus on our national defense SDA-enabled space warfighting mission. You've likely seen the National Academy of Public Administration report endorsing this initiative. It's a positive and synergistic division of labor. Commerce will focus on critical space tra traffic management and space situational awareness services, while DOD focuses on domain awareness, warfighting operations. Building this new future is still a work in progress. We're still really laying the foundation for the success of this initiative, while continuing to develop the specifics of this new critical partnership. This will not be a case where we, the US Space Force, hand off the baton and exit the track. We'll continue to work hand in hand with the Department of Commerce, bridging knowledge and best practices that will allow both Commerce and DOD to successfully implement our two distinct but complementary missions. Significant challenges remain, but we'll overcome them. Changes in our approach to SSA and SDA ultimately reflect an overarching shift in mindset and philosophy philosophy of how we operate in space as a warfighting domain. Without that shift, our vision of the battle space is myopic, and that myo myopia leaves us vulnerable, outpaced, and exposed to the potential of losing our freedom of action in space. Fortunately, our Chief of Space Operations, General Jay Raymond, understood implicitly the value of SDA and had the foresight to give the mission set its own delta in our new organizational construct for the Space Force. Deltas, if you're not yet aware, merge our operational and tactical level of warfighting operations, collapsing a traditional Air Force operations group and wing into one new light, lean, and agile combat organization. Our SDA Delta, Space Delta II, ensures dedicated resources and laser focus on the SDA mission set. Its mission is clear. Delta II prepares and presents assigned and attached forces for the purpose of executing combat-ready SDA operations to deter aggression and, if necessary, fight to protect and defend the U.S. and our allies from attack in, through, and from space. Combat-ready SDA operations. That part of the mission statement alone expresses the real difference in today's approach to awareness in the space domain and further differentiates the largely civil function of SSA from the inherently military function of SDA. For the DOD, SDA is pivotal to our warfighting capabilities. I use that adjective intentionally, of course, not just as a clever means of invoking the current vernacular. Even after we fully pivot SDA and we've advanced the mission set to the point where we've worked the name pivot SDA out of a job, SDA will remain pivotal. It's so pivotal, in fact, and so central to our effort to develop space combat capability that we fully incorporated it into the traditional weapons school taught methodology for combat operations known as the kill chain. There are a number of complex mechanical elements to the full kill chain covering find, fix, track, target, engage, and assess. But more simply, borrowing General Colin Powell's famous dictum, the kill chain philosophy allows us to find the enemy and kill it. SDA is central to application of that kill chain. It provides, it provides us a higher quality of data with better characterization and understanding of adversary intent, while doing so within actionable timelines that put us inside potential adversaries OODA loop. Last year, two of our Space Force thought leaders, Colonels Raj Agrawal and Colonel Fernangel, observed in an article published in War on the Rocks that, quote, as nations impose their will in the space domain, satellites maneuver, react, and respond, requiring the same type of fidelity that provides location data for friendly and adversarial forces on the ground, in the air, and on the seas. It is useless, negligent, and potentially dangerous to invest in the ability to shoot without the ability to see, unquote. The responsive awareness SDA supplies thus becomes the key enabler of an effective kill chain in the space warfighting domain. We must be able to find and react to our potential adversary. SDA provides fidelity, fidelity and a roadmap to our warfighters who are prepared to neutralize threats when called upon to do so. That's why the cognitive dimension of SDA is as important or even more so than just the physical dimensions of SDA. Having knowledge of his enemy's strategy and th tactics, Themistocles anticipated that Xerxes and the Persian Navy would follow his forces into the strait. 
He also predicted that the large Persian ships would struggle with navigating through its narrow passageway, leaving them vulnerable to attack. His keen characterization of the battle space and of his enemy was especially valuable. The resulting understanding he developed of the strategic context and the opportunity it afforded him provide invaluable lessons on the usefulness and applicability of SDA in today's space warfighting domain. The United States and our allies are rapidly expanding our space warfighting capability to reflect the national imperatives of operating in space while answering the tasks outlined in multiple national level directives. The military space enterprise is shifting to a warfighting focus in order to protect and defend our collective interests and equities against rapidly emerging and formidable threats. Our warfighting focus for the space domain has driven a commensurate shift in the application of the SDA mission set to operational space warfighting realities. There are no warfighting operations in space without awareness of the battle space and knowledge of adversary capabilities and intentions. That's why robust SDA is so vital to this new national imperative for space. That new imperative has compelled the evolution of SDA as a mindset from a baseline capability to one of US Space Force's five space power core competencies, from a mere function to a service-wide philosophy. And of course, we don't really aspire to the mindset of the particular philosopher I quoted earlier in my remarks. That said, my favorite Homer, Homer Simpson, was unknowingly prescient in his observation that reveals the danger of information overload. It also reflects the consequent value of an SDA mission set that can translate volumes of information into the knowledge that informs the wisdom necessary for effective warfighting decisions. So thanks again to Dr. Hanna and the Amos staff for giving me the opportunity to speak today. For those attending over our virtual platform, thank you for the work you continue to do during these unique circumstances. This virtual conference speaks to our ability to successfully adapt to our given environment, progress together, and affect the necessary pivot in SDA for warfighting effectiveness. God bless the United States of America and our United States Space Force. And with that, I'd be happy to use the remaining time to answer any questions uh, that anyone on the conference may have. Thank you very much, General Whiting. Awesome, awesome speech. As the general said, we have about 20 minutes um, where he has graciously agreed to uh, take questions from the, the forum and uh, have a little Q&A. So please do submit uh, ver via the platform any questions you might have and we'll, we'll tee those up. While we're, while we're waiting uh, for, for some of those to start rolling in, I, I do have a couple of questions that, that uh, I've prearranged uh, for you, knowing that we might have a little bit of technology induced lag here. And uh, I'll start with uh, this one. General Whiting, you just spoke in depth about uh, how we've evolved from SSA or space situational awareness to space domain awareness as a key part of uh, our warfighting capability in the space domain. You described SDA as the foundation to that warfighting capability. Um, and you talked a little bit about how Space Force and Department of Commerce will, will segregate some responsibilities there between SSA and SDA. But for SDA, are there additional elements in that foundation which might be the responsibility of other government agencies? Uh, yeah, great question. Thank you for that. And I'll, I'll talk to a few of those areas. Uh, one is we're going to need great women and men to come into our force, our new space force, and to execute these missions. So uh, we are looking for the best and brightest, uh, the most diverse uh, group who represent America, who are uh, fluent in uh, science, technology, uh, engineering, math, the arts. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we need the nation to continue to produce those young men and women. I also would highlight two other areas. One is uh, cyber defense. Of course, space operations is a global, uh, ex it's a global uh, enterprise by nature. And uh, we have to be able to secure those global networks uh, with our cyber capabilities. And that's really a whole of government uh, effort as well as uh, leveraging what commercial industry can bring to us. And then we'd also highlight intelligence as I, I spoke to, understanding the intentions of potential adversaries, objectives, what their strategies are uh, will be very important to us. And so partnering across the uh, in intelligence community, uh, both within DOD and outside of DOD will be foundational to our success in SDA as well. Thank you, General. Um, got another one, they're starting to roll in. So thanks, thanks uh, partners out there for submitting. Here's one on partnerships, reflecting on partnerships 
And, and since you were the, the commander of the CSPOC uh, a while back, are you able to reliably ingest data from foreign entities and partners at this time and, and use that as part of the foundations of SDA? Yeah, we are making progress each and every month uh, doing that exact thing. Uh, that to, based on some wise decisions made in years past, uh, we have uh, developed some capabilities that allow us to bring in uh, data from uh, non-traditional sets, uh, non-traditional sources, if you will, whether those are foreign partners uh, or commercial sources. Uh, and we, can, we now have the ability to translate that data and bring it into uh, various elements of our, uh, of our tracking uh, enterprise. So we are making continued efforts there. I will uh, thank our uh, allied partners out there, whether that's uh, Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand, um, we could think of about Japan uh, and others. Uh, we have increasing partnerships with them, not only to gain additional access to their data, but also to figure out how do we federate uh, the work that we do uh, so that we are leveraging their expertise and capabilities and bringing their knowledge and wisdom into our enterprise as well. So we just continually continue to make progress and I'm excited about where that's headed. Awesome. Uh, continuing on the theme of partnerships, there's a question here that's pretty interesting. It says, you've outlined the deterrence calculus for space warfighting planning, and can you comment on any ways U.S. initiatives to execute SDA activities with its partners contributes to this vision of goodwill, particularly as many more space players enter the operating environment? So how are we using our partners, not just for data, um, but for strategic partnerships, deterrence, goodwill, and coalition building? Yeah, so over the last year, um, you're probably all tracking, uh, really led by General Raymond, our Chief of Space Operations, and until recently, of course, he was the commander of U.S. Space Command. Uh, there has been public messaging about, um, about actors who are not acting responsibly in space, uh, whether that's uh, Russia or China or others. And if you go and look at those uh, messaging uh, opportunities that we had on the U.S. side, you will see uh, many of those echoed by our key allied partners. Of course, now we have under U.S. Space Command Operation Olympic Defender, which is now an international partnership, and we have multiple countries that have announced that they are a part of that, and others are looking at that partnership. But that means we operate day-to-day -day in space under a named operation. Um, and so that contributes uh, to uh, deterrence as well by letting others know that we are in this together with our allies. And the reason we are in this together is because we are stronger together, and we recognize that and our uh, allies and partners recognize that. Thank you, General Whiting. Um, an another question here is a little bit of sensitivity with this one. We hear frequently of the need for U.S. Spacecom and the USSF to strengthen, adapt warfighting culture to the new environment, the warfighting environment, but you do have a lot of partnerships with non-military organizations, and in many cases, those are critical partnerships. So, so I mean, how do you bring them along and, and what, how do we affect the culture to be willing uh, to join you know, non-military organizations to help us in, in this endeavor? Yeah, of course, it is the unique uh, role of the, the armed forces in the United States, the Title X forces, uh, to conduct military operations on behalf of the nation. Uh, but it's, it's similar to other domains where uh, in the maritime domain, the air domain, the ground domain, we have a series of partnerships uh, where we, whether that's commercial industry, whether it's uh, academic institutions, research labs, um, uh, outside advocacy groups. Um, and so certainly we don't expect those groups to conduct military operations, but, but we do ask for your help in, in uh, helping us to think through how do we better enable our mission? How do we move quicker relative to the threat? Uh, of course, up till now, our space, space architecture has really been built for efficiency, uh, not effectiveness in the face of uh, enemy threats. And so we need all of these various partners to help us uh, to, to move quicker, uh, to move more effectively uh, in the face of, of these threats. So uh, it, it is a whole of community effort, but we recognize that we have the unique role uh, of uh, executing the military operations. Thank you, General. Um, I know it's, it's a little pre-decisional. Uh, maybe, maybe you can or can't speak to this, but you, you do have an impending stand-up of one of the new field commands you're about to take command of. Can you talk to us a little bit more just about the new organizational construct of, of the Space Force and particularly Space Operations Command? Yeah, happy to. Um, so General Raymond has given us a vision that uh, Space Force will be light, lean, agile, and uh, nimble. And so to do that, we are taking out two levels of, um, of command echelon uh, from what you've traditionally seen in the Air Force. So we've already transformed uh, our, our 
what was traditionally an Air Force wing uh, into new organizations. So you used to have a colonel who was a group commander who would oversee squadrons, and you'd have a colonel who was a uh, wing commander who would oversee multiple groups. We've collapsed those two uh, levels of command, and now we have a new level that I talked to in my speech called Space Deltas, and they execute uh, exclusively individual space mission areas. So Space Delta II is our space domain awareness. Space Delta III is space electro electronic warfare and so on. And then at the same time, we've created peer organizations called garrisons that command our warfighting platforms, which are our bases. So we have a Peterson Schriever garrison that oversees uh, running the, those two installations in Cheyenne Mountain and then some other installations not here in Colorado Springs. So that's, that's how we've collapsed one level of 06 command and then Traditionally in the Air Force, you've seen a numbered Air Force commanded by a two or three star and a major command, typically commanded by a four star. We've collapsed those two levels of command into what will be called field commands. And we're just a couple weeks away, Kelly, as you noted, to standing up the first of our field commands, which will be Space Operations Command. It will be headquartered here in Colorado Springs, and it will oversee all of the forces that we present to U.S. Space Command. And as such, we will be the U.S. Space Force component to U.S. Space Command. Now, for the next year or so, we'll continue to carry some functions that others will eventually take on as other field commands stand up. Um, and we'll continue to support the space staff in the Pentagon as it stands up. Uh, but over the next year or two, we will become a very ops-focused command, exclusively uh, uh, working every day in support of U.S. Space Command and ensuring that we are uh, generating, preparing, and sustaining those forces on behalf of U.S. Space Command. Thank you. Thank you very much, General. Um, we mentioned kind of generically some of the partnerships um, with other uh, allies uh, and other partner nations, um, some of the other Department of Government uh, folks like Commerce that you're working very closely with. There's a question here uh, talking more to commercial entities and leveraging um, commercial space, um, entrepreneurship, innovation, and the boom there. Anything, anything you, can, you can speak to in that regard? Yeah, there's been a whole host of innovations there. And um, you know, these questions are probably best suited for some of my uh, peers out at uh, LA Air Force Base, but we are definitely excited about taking advantage of what uh, the commercial uh, space and software industry is bringing to us this day, uh, these days. I was just talking to a friend last night and uh, you know, she, she noted that we truly are in the second golden age of space exploration because of what much of the commercial industry is bringing to us. So of course, uh, we have uh, a number of efforts ongoing. Uh, we've had uh, space pitch days. Uh, I think we're about to have some more um, some more efforts along those lines. Uh, we have a, a space consortium that SMC has, which has a couple hundred companies that are providing white papers and giving us ideas about how to go faster. We have uh, new um, uh, development programs where we're using DevSecOps, rapid uh, development capabilities, where uh, instead of writing, you know, 800 page requirements documents and then handing those over and coming back five years later with a, a system. We're giving real time operator requirements and, and rapidly innovating where within a couple months we're able to take advantage of what commercial industry is bringing. So we think this is the future um, and we, we just want to continue the partnerships and uh, the good uh, innovation and thinking uh, that commercial industry can bring to us. Thank you, General. Um, I know based on our interactions over the, the last couple of days that this next question is probably near and dear to your heart. Uh, since, since space is becoming a, a critical warfighting domain, can you say anything about specific plans to increase the cyber resilience of, of our spacecraft that we have on orbit? Yeah, thank you for whomever asked that question. Uh, if you look at the United States Space Force, uh, of course, we're in the process right now of transferring uh, airmen out of the Air Force into the Space Force. You can see I'm still wearing U.S. Air Force tape. I'm, I'm still a member of the Air Force, although I've been assigned to the Space Force. Soon, in a few weeks, I will transfer over. Uh, but there are five career field areas that are actually going to all transfer into Space Force and be indigenous parts of Space Force. Those are space operations, and you may have seen uh, some news reports over the last few weeks most of our junior space operators are now transferred into Space Force. A few more sets to come over the coming months. Um, we will have intelligence, we will have cyber, and we will have engineering and acquisition. So those are the five career areas. So I, I'll, I'll pause on cyber. As I mentioned a moment ago, we know that uh, 
cyber attack is where we are most likely to, uh, to, to face the enemy um, in space. Now that doesn't mean, because we do know that uh, potential uh, adversaries are building capabilities to attack us on orbit or on the ground, but the barrier of entry for cyber is lower than uh, it is for some of those other ways of attacking us. So we believe we have to have our own indigenous cyber experts. They initially will be focused almost exclusively on cyber defense. And we have a Space Delta, Space Delta 6, whose mission is to conduct those cyber operations. We are standing up teams that will uh, permanently reside with our space operators for all of our various weapon systems to, uh, to, to monitor those networks and to see the type of activity on those networks uh, that would cause us alarm and allow us to defend those networks. We're also building higher level relationships up to uh, all the way up to US Cyber Command to help with those defenses. But this will be a principal focus area of the United States Space Force as we move forward. And it's why we're so excited about having those cyber operators join us in Space Force over the coming few months. Thank you again. Um, some some interplay. Those uh, online supporting the Amos 2020 conference might or might not be aware that at the same time, we have the airspace and cyber conference for AFA going on on the east coast of the nation. And so some some people tracking General Raymond's comments there noted a desire to go fast in acquiring capabilities. Uh, reflecting on the earlier question concerning foreign data sources, commercial capabilities that are operational today there that can ingest and process this data. Um, do we have a strategy for purchasing relevant commercial capabilities internationally as well as domestically? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, and, and what I can speak to uh, just from my, my experiential base is that uh, we are working with uh, some of our closest allies right now to do some co-development uh, programs. Uh, some of the efforts out at LA now, we're working to make uh, joint program offices or combined program offices where we allow our international partners to participate in that. Uh, we also are working at the requirements level with some of our international partners so that as they build systems, those systems are interoperable with us from the beginning and they fill gaps for us from the beginning uh, so that collectively as an enterprise, again, we're stronger together. Uh, General Raymond noted in his comments yesterday that we are soon to put a couple uh, hosted payloads on some Norwegian satellites. We're gonna, uh, that will allow us to get that capability at $800 million cheaper and three years faster. So we're looking for all of those opportunities. And, uh, and I think we're seeing just on grow, ongoing acceleration in our ability to do so. This one is really open-ended and again, maybe better for, for your colleagues at Space Systems Command, but it was asked of you, so I'll, I'll throw it out there. The question is, you talked about, again, the pivot from SSA to SDA and the infrastructure we'd established for SSA. The question is, is the infrastructure in terms of IT networks, uh, et cetera, sufficient for that pivot to SDA or are there things we need to do to improve the underlying infrastructure? Yeah. So. As General Raymond and uh, before, before he became Chief of Space Operations, General Goldfein, the former Chief of uh, the Air Force would say, we have the world's best space capabilities today and we have the world's best space surveillance network, uh, but absolutely the systems we have today need to be upgraded and, and refreshed. We don't have the transport layer that we need to get all the data that our sensors are collecting uh, into uh, our command and control systems. Uh, our command and control systems, while being uh, improved right now, uh, our legacy systems, um, and we are working to upgrade those to more modern systems. Uh, one of the reasons we're so excited about the partnership with the Department of Commerce uh, is that they're going to have an opportunity to kind of start fresh. Now, the Space Policy Directive 4, which laid out this vision of how commerce and DOD would operate together, um, it, it says that DOD will continue to produce the authoritative catalog and then uh, Commerce will take the publicly releasable uh, portions of that, uh, which is the overwhelming vast majority, and then they'll work new systems to, to better uh, get that information out and to, and to help others with basic space traffic management and SSA. And we think they're going to develop things that are going to be helpful for us. So we're really excited about these partnerships, but we do have to continue to advance and improve the systems that we have. Thank you, General. Uh, this, one, this one's kind of interesting uh, to, to me personally, and, and I'll, so I'll expand the scope of it a little bit. The, the specific question here is about, you have a small cadre of space operators that exist right now. Are you bringing in uh, from other services or from the Department of the Air Force 
folks without necessarily space operations training to, to cross train. And, and then my expansion would be, maybe you can just talk a little bit more about how people are actually joining the space force or getting, or getting moved over both, both blue suit and, and civilian. Yeah, one of the interesting aspects of this is of course we are a volunteer service. So for any individual to transfer out of the, uh, the Air Force or the Army, Navy, Marines, into the Space Force, they have to be a volunteer because if otherwise we'd essentially be drafting them. We don't have a draft anymore. Uh, so all of those airmen who are in the process of transferring are all volunteers. Many of them uh, do have space experience, but I tell you, some of the cyber, intel, acquisition, and engineers don't. They're just inspired by space, and it's what they've always wanted to do, and this is their chance. Uh, so we, we do have some of those uh, fresh, uh, if you will, you know, fresh minds coming to us. Um, as far as members from the Army, Navy, and Marines, uh, those discussions are ongoing. I do expect uh, we will see some of those transfers uh, probably in the next year or two. But again, those individuals will have to be volunteers. They cannot be forced to transfer. Uh, but w whenever I get a chance to speak to those joint audiences, I always get questions from those uh, service members about how can they join the Space Force. They're excited and inspired by this as well. Uh, of course, uh, given our scale, it won't be a lot of people because we're so, so much smaller than the other services, uh, but we're looking forward to those opportunities to bring on uh, members from non-Air Force services as well. Uh, this, this is an interesting one that um, if, if, you, if you need to phone a friend, I can help you with. But the, the question is, can you speak to your vision on collaborating with UARCs, so university affiliated research centers, centers to continue uh, to, to break close gaps and, and close on current critical needs as we leap into space warfighting? So the question is about UARCs. Yeah, and all I can say is at the most general level, I'm aware of what UARCs are. It's just not my day-to-day -day job jar to, uh, to work in basic research. I will say that we know it's one of the huge strengths of the United States military is these, are these relationships that we have with universities and how we get this basic uh, research. Um, so Kelly, if you could help me there. Sure, sure. so uh, I, we discussed this actually yesterday. Um, and so uh, General Raymond, as you mentioned, the Chief of Space Operations is incredibly interested in pursuing innovation wherever it can be found. And UARCs are a great way to do that. So what those are, are special authorities that the department has to establish relationships with universities that have key uh, capabilities in certain areas. Now, uh, the Department of the Navy has a number of UARCs that uh, the Department of the Army does. The Department of the Air Force currently doesn't, but General Raymond wants to change that. And uh, with my group, actually, out in Maui, um, we have um, Air Force contracts under Naval UARC authority that we're using as a pathfinder uh, to, to help the Space Operations Command working with your staff here. So we are pursuing that, the Space Force is pursuing it, and, uh, and the laboratory is, is trying to facilitate that because as you say we, we recognize the, the expertise and the capabilities and we want that innovation uh, feeding the Space Force from from wherever we can get it. I think we're getting the virtual hook here. I, I think we are General. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll just say thank you again for graciously uh, agreeing to speak and for staying around to, to answer some of the, the forum's questions. Uh, I think it's been a, a great session, a great start. Um, and look forward to three more days of this. I think our plan is to turn it back over to Leslie and the uh, MEDB staff and, and get ready for the SSA Policy Forum, which I think is next on the agenda. Thank you again, General. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. I hope to see everyone in Maui little, next little, little, little. There. Mahalo and a hui ho. Until we meet again, we thank you for sharing your time with us. We hope to welcome you to Maui for the 22nd Amos Conference, September 14th through the 17th. Aloha.